sleep the night before that you know that you're going to be run off your feet the next day. But you're doing good things for the community, so it's a good place to be. The orange tier, high, occurs a few times each year. So the sort of severe weather events that generally you handle within your region, no problem. And that they're, they're quite common. You've got a really good understanding of the environments that are conducive to the threat. Yellow or moderate, these are the sorts of warnings that you find yourself issuing all the time. For us, coastal waters warnings, as soon as the winds are greater than 25 knots. I live on Bass Strait, one of the most treacherous shipping areas of the world. There's constantly strong wind warnings current for Bass Strait. These sort of, this level, you should be able to deal with quite easily within your region. And of course, the low end event. Now, these numbers, uh, I, I spoke to Phil King, had made him come for dinner with me, even though he's retired, and said, where did these numbers come from, Phil, while I, I was away? And because they seem to be working quite well from what we've seen so far in the year that we've been doing the National Hazard Outlook and, and the post-event review management. The numbers were developed purely by looking at the post-event review management template for the community and operations. So before you get to the impact modifiers in the PERM one, not the National Hazard Outlook one, which is actually takes the exposure rows out, but there's actually 11 rows. And uh, I'm not sure if I've got, got it here, but if you look at the low, um, the low impact, where you're adding up the ones, would add up to 11. We halved that five, rounded down, and, and put five in as the, um, as, as the tier for zero to five as being the low tier. Six to 16 came from the next column, the twos. 11 lots of two is 22. Halfway between 11 and 22, about 16. Six to 16 was the moderate tier. Then the next tier, you can see 22 to 33 was, it would be the numbers. So 11 threes, 33, 22 to 33, so um, 27, about halfway there, 26, 27. So that's all it is. It's just straight out averaging, thinking about how the process works and about how things should land. And that averaging, from our point of view, seems to work. And this is why I'm so keen to get your feedback to see whether or not for your events that tiering is about right also, or if we need to change that tiering, or if you would change that tiering, more to the point. There's a lot of words here. I won't go through them all, I'll spare you. <laughs> uh, but this is from early in 2017 when we were developing the PERM process. There was a document, and the words in this document were the ideas being developed around how we should, uh, how each tier should fall. So tier one, moderate events, small weather events, um, a tsunami, but just a low level marine warning. So a tsunami that's not enough to inundate land is really not a threat, but there's some, some currents around that we need to worry about. Tier two, major flood events um, with major flooding at key forecast locations. Tier three, significant government impact and interest. Similar sorts of words that what we've been going through during this afternoon. Really things haven't changed too much as we've gone through the process. What else did we align with? I've spoken a lot about the State Control Centre in Victoria. Uh, emergency management levels in Australia are basically why we picked the same colours that most of you have picked and we wanted to be aligned with the emergency management Victoria warning level. We used that as a, uh, as a guide as we did it. The State Control Centre in Victoria was one of the first established and they're advanced in ways that some of the other state and territories, not catching up, but uh, have been following. So it makes sense to follow what they did. 
the words. Zero to five, unlikely possible. Uh, six to 16, likely certain, unlikely possible, unlikely. So these words here, um, that's where they fall on the matrix in the uh, National Hazard Outlook. So if you remember, I should have put it up, I apologise, but if you remember in that matrix there's certain colours and uh, so each colour for a yellow um, could be in a number of boxes such as unlikely possible. So an unlikely event, but it's possible, has the same rating or colour or, tier or um, level as a likely event that's, actually, that's certain. For operations, similar thing, but we can develop this ourselves. And uh, so the, um, the boxes that they fall in are, are, are the similar. The actual numbers, same process, but there's less rows in the operational rubric. So the numbers are lower. It seems to be working OK for us. The, uh, the way the verification in the PERM process is working of the National Hazard Outlook forecast seems to be verifying quite well. You'll remember the Marcus, TC Marcus event where we forecast a low end high. What occurred was actually a high end high. So it still feels like we're in the right thresholds, even though the event was more intense because the cyclone went over the capital and not, uh, didn't go out to sea. There's been a considerable amount of discussion about whether or not we should have another tier level. Remember that Queensland product that I put up? It wasn't graphical, but it had the black for the really, really big event. That event that you might only see once in your career, that event maybe once or twice in your career, that event that you'll never forget, every detail about it because you were there for every step of the way, Major fatalities. Black Saturday's my one, although I've got a few. <laughs> I've been there with, with a few, but Black Saturday is, uh, is one that everyone that worked through that event will remember their whole careers. Hopefully I'll get through my career without seeing another one. Chances are I probably will. So maybe we need a black. Maybe we need that next level up. I'll be interested in what you think about that. So that's how we develop the thresholds. Let's, it's the last lot of slides I've got for the day, thankfully. <laughs> uh, and let's consider the international definitions of risk and how that can flow into your impact forecast that you develop. Um, I was asked earlier on today about uh, whether or not we have uh, who, who manages risk in our agency. Helen Foster, she's our Resilience and Security Chief, and she has developed this document, Enterprise Risk Management Framework, which is in, intimately aligned with the Bureau's strategy. And it's still in draft form, I believe, even though it says 2017, but it's about to be updated. And it is a product, uh, uh, it is something that the National Hazard Outlook needs to be aligned with because they're doing similar things in similar ways. So, what other documentation is there that we might need to be aligned with? There's an ISO 31000, it's just been updated, risk management guidelines. There it is. Then there's the WMO guidelines that we've seen a number of times, we've been working through. There's a National Emergency Risk Assessment Guidelines. And that's, that's what it looks like in Australia. There's bodies and working groups working and keeping that together. And then there's the Bureau of Meteorology Enterprise Risk Management Framework. In the ISO, risk is defined as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Put your hands up if you've seen that before. 
So no one in the room has seen that definition of risk? Don't worry, either had I about six weeks ago. <laughs> well, sorry, I shouldn't say don't worry, worry, <laughs> because it is relevant. Uh, I also worried about it across a whole weekend, trying to come to terms with what does the effect of uncertainty on objectives mean? Down the bottom, I restate what's in the WMO guidelines. For the purpose of these guidelines, risk is defined as the probability and magnitude of harm on human beings and their livelihoods and assets because of their exposure and vulnerability to a hazard. So we're used to that. We know what exposure is. We know what vulnerability is. We know what a hazard is, in our sense. And so we can have a go at forecasting impact, which is intimately aligned with risk to communities. Uncertainty, that maps pretty well to probability. Objectives, well, what's our objective? Ultimately, we're trying to reduce impact on socio-economic activities. So that's there too. Effect of the uncertainty on the objectives. My interpretation, the best interpretation I've come to so far is that the effect being a deviation from the, the expected is really incorporated in that whole definition of risk in the WMO guidelines. Risk is According to the ISO, expressed in risk sources, potential events, risk event consequences, potential event likelihood. Now these words have come up a couple of times over the last couple of days. I realise that having a good understanding of the international standard definitions of those words is needed as I go through the process of developing these sorts of products. OK, so how does it fit? There's a principles and a framework and a process in the ISO. In our National Emergency Risk Assessment Guidelines, there's the principles and framework, and then there's the process. And without going through this whole flow chart, you identify the risk, you analyse the risk, you evaluate the risk, and then you go to risk treatment. That's what we're doing with the National Hazard Outlook. That's where we fit. We fit in the process. Thankfully, <laughs> when I was working through with Helen Foster how our National Hazard Outlook uh, aligned with our Enterprise Risk Management Framework, it became very quickly obvious that it was well aligned and that, we f uh, that that product fitted within the process of the risk management. OK, so this is the ISO in one slide. Uh, I won't read through it all, but the risk management framework and the principles feed into the process, clearly. Uh, words like integrated, structured and comp comprehensive, and best available information, they're the principles that we want. The Framework it needs to be integrated, improvement, design, implement. But the process, that's where we are. Identify, analyse, evaluate and treat. And so even though I'm still struggling with the definition, the effect of uncertainty on objectives, I can see how we do align with the international standard for assessing risk. So threshold considerations, we talked a little bit about doing another threshold for those once in a career events. We need to align with our national documentation. We also need to align with our enterprise documentation. We have a matrix, which was pointed out yesterday, it wasn't really a matrix because it hasn't got numbers in it, <laughs> by someone very clever in the audience, in our National Hazard Outlook, our Enterprise Risk Management Framework has a matrix, which is a matrix. It has got numbers in it. 
The way it gets the numbers is it looks at the rows and the columns and it multiplies them together and produces a number. Guess what? It's five by five. Ours is four by four. Another senior manager, who, well, I have lots of senior managers who like to come and point things out to me. Another senior manager came to me and said, you've got a four by four, the enterprise risk management framework has five by five, you need to change yours. And we said, okay, <laughs> best, best we start looking at this. And I got together with Helen and became very clear very quickly that we do have a five by five. Remember I pointed out the five thresholds at the start? It's just that the bottom row and the, and the left hand column, we don't include because we're not going to include a rare and insignificant weather event in the National Hazard Outlook. This pretend matrix fits in this real matrix right here. From minor, moderate, major, severe. Unlikely, possible, likely, extremely likely. So we've, there's some work that can come together with the words. What I've realised in the last two days is that CAP has words. And I realise that these words need to align with the words in CAP. There would be benefits uh, for that occurring. The low, moderate, high, extreme, minor, moderate, major, severe, outstanding, easy enough to align together. The other thing is the way the enterprise risk management framework multiplies the fifth column by the fifth row to get a 25 extreme in the top right hand corner. I like the way that what that does is that gives a rating of extreme from 25 down to 16. So you can have low end extreme and high end extreme. Now we do the same thing with our rubrics. So I can argue that this is a matrix because each one of these letters has a number associated with it that puts them in their particular box. And I've talked about how we assessed Marcus as a low end high before the event and we verified Marcus after the event as a high end high. Uh, but there's a simplicity in this technique that might be worth you considering. I'm certainly considering it. I'm not sure if we need to go to two levels of uh, quantification over and above what we're already doing with our rubrics though. Okay. From strategy to risk. I work in national forecast services and this is our goal statement. Leverage our knowledge and insight to save zero, to have zero lives lost through natural hazards and increase social and economic benefits by one billion to all Australians by 2022. Should be easy. <laughs> There's been lots of debate. It's a goal statement that we all strive towards. The debate centres around should you have a goal which there's a very good chance won't be achieved, zero lives lost in particular. Okay, that's our goal. Let's see how the strategy so that's basically our strategy and our goal. How does that fit in with risk? Risk, consequence, category. So let's consider critical assets and systems. Let's consider a risk, an example. Say we had a warning that was ineffectual or a forecast, a missed event. Description, ineffectual warning or forecast impacts public safety, customers, business and the Bureau's reputation. Okay. The consequence. Maybe there's lives lost through natural hazards or maybe loss of customer confidence. Maybe we lose a contract. Maybe someone goes somewhere else. Credibility is number one for us all. Likelihood, measured by how often it happens. 
and the risk rating. So use the enterprise risk management matrix. So that's how our enterprise risk framework works. The Sorry, I said, uh, somehow I think I've missed a slide, but that's fine. So what we're putting together in the puzzle is our organisational strategy, our enterprise risk management framework, and our national hazard outlook, the threshold is ultimately where it fits, to give a consistent risk level for reporting. And that consistent risk level is aligned through our documentation, our national documentation and the ISO. We're also heavily aligned with the WMO guidelines. Any questions on that final set of slides? <coughs> 